Welcome once again to our virtual conference entitled The Impact of COVID-19 on the Philippine Tourism Industry. To begin the program, please welcome our moderator, the CEO of YNS 1847, a sought-after hotel guru, Mr. Merrill Yu. Thank you very much, everybody, for spending time with us this afternoon. I'll find, I know you're going to find the next uh, hour with Hannah very, very enlightening. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce her to you. She's a graduate of Oxford University and over the past eight years has crisscrossed Southeast Asia and gained a deep firsthand insight into trends developing in the region, as well as a passion for both Southeast Asian and Muslim travel sectors. She started by building up FIT, in, which is Treatment in the in, <clears throat> sorry, International Travel, outbound travel at one of the largest travel agencies in Malaysia before founding her own travel startup. Her startup was subsequently acquired by Malaysian travel technology company GoQual, and in 2018, she launched her own boutique consulting and sales representation company, Pear Anderson. Hannah has authored reports on the economic impact of Muslim travel and has spoken on numerous occasions at, at prestigious travel conferences, such as the Federation of ASEAN Travel Agents and ITB Asia. Her reports have been cited in publications such as Forbes, Middle East, Web in Travel, and Travel Weekly Asia. Please join me in welcoming Hannah, who we're very, very happy to have with us and share her wisdom and insight. Hannah, without much further ado, it's off to you. Lovely. Well, thank you, Meryl. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Let me just share my screen. Um, and so this afternoon, I'm talking about what the impact of COVID-19 has been on tourism in the Philippines. Um, I mean, and I guess the initial answer to that is huge, right? It's, it's had a huge impact. Um, so just recently, just this week, I think, the Department of Tourism in Philippines came out and said 4.8 million Filipino tourism workers have been impacted by COVID-19. And that's out of, I think, last year, she said something like 5.7 million um, Filipino travel, you know, Filipino workers in tourism industry altogether. Um, so where did we all start with this? Well, I mean, I'm sure you guys already know, but it's it's been seven long months since, um, you know, community quarantine was imposed on Metro Manila. So that was already back 15th of March, um, 19th of March, Philippine, uh, Philippines banned inbound tourism, outbound non-essential um, tourism. And it's 16th of October today, and Manila is still under a GCQ, right? So it, it, there has not been very much progression, I guess we can say. Um, so let's have a look at what is now allowed for tourism. I mean, for a long time, it was really, really limited. Now we can see that it is starting to open up a little bit in terms of opportunities. So you have domestic tourism in a lot of MGCQ areas. Of course, it's all subject to local government unit approval. Um, MICE can now happen, which is great. Again, at 50% capacity in MGCQ areas, it's still got that kind of limited age around it, so 21 to 59 years old. We've got staycations now. So that was something new that was implemented on the 1st of October, but again, has really strict conditions. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, diving operators who are in GCQ areas have just been told that they're allowed to open. Um, and kind of breaking news, I think from the last 30 minutes is that travel agents who are in GCQ areas will now be able to open at 50% um, capacity, 100% in MGCQ areas. And more breaking news again, I think from the last hour or so, so from the 21st of October, um, non-essential outbound travel for Filipinos will be allowed once more. So we can see a, a kind of movement, but like I said, it, it is pretty slow and it's really quite restricted. You know, if you are a tourism business right now, there are very limited opportunities for revenue for you. So let's have a quick look. How does Philippines compare to other countries 
um, across ASEAN. And so like Meryl said, what I am doing at the moment and what I have been doing is I've been tracking the developments of COVID-19, not just on the Philippines, but across um, the ASEAN region. I've been doing that since, since about March um, time. And it's, I mean, you can see here, I've got a kind of traffic light um, chart. So in terms of lockdown, greens mean there's no lockdown. Orange means, I call it a partial lockdown. Um, so that means that maybe non-essential services, perhaps things like clubs are still closed or perhaps schools are still closed. Um, and a full lockdown would be, you know, closure of everything. We've, we've already moved beyond that point now through throughout the Southeast Asian region of you know a complete lockdown we're not seeing that anymore which is really really positive positive. Um, and indeed we're seeing some countries which have removed pretty much all of their lockdown restrictions altogether so Laos has done so Thailand has done so Vietnam has done so um, and then you've still got a bulk of countries countries like Singapore which are still pretty strict despite the fact that they've got a really good handle on the virus now um, you've got countries like Indonesia, which I think is about the same kind of levels as the Philippines, which are kind of on and off with their restrictions. So they had Jakarta under a stricter lockdown. They kind of uh, released that last week. And countries like Cambodia, which are pretty much all open, except their schools are still closed. So I kind of classify it as a partial lockdown. Mm. In terms of whether inbound or outbound travel are allowed, I mean, you can see there, no country right now in ASEAN is completely open to either inbound tourists or are completely open to allowing their own citizens to travel out either. It's either done by visa restrictions or it's done by um, banning international commercial flights altogether, um, like some countries um, like Thailand have done, like Vietnam had done to quite recently. Um, and if we look in terms of cases, well, I guess the good news for Philippines now as of yesterday is that you guys are not the the leading number of cases in ASEAN that I don't know that honor I suppose has gone to Indonesia um, now so they've got is, what about 400,000 400, now for now 4,000 difference something like that and um, so we can see there's progress it's moving but it's slow what about in terms of domestic tourism how does um, ASEAN compare um, to the Philippines? Where, where does Philippines fall in that? And actually it's, it's pretty much kind of, you, you've got like this top tier where domestic travel has been permitted and has been permitted for a long time. Um, so you've got countries like Cambodia where it, domestic travel has been open for a really long time, but you saw that they had really low case numbers. Um, you have countries like uh, Laos, again, where domestic travel is permitted. Thailand has been permitted for quite some time since the 1st of June. But you can see here I've got an orange for Malaysia and the Philippines. And that's because it, domestic travel isn't open for everyone. You know, in the Philippines right now, you can't fly to any island you choose to, right? You've got to obey all of these LGU approvals. Maybe there aren't even any domestic flights. Um, so it's limiting in that way. Um, Malaysia is orange because we have gone through another lockdown. We've now got some interstate travel restrictions as well to contend with, which is really going to dampen uh, the kind of domestic travel appetite there in Malaysia. Um, and in Myanmar, well, I mean, they, they are really experiencing quite a rapid increase in the cases. They've got a very poor infrastructure there. Um, so they have banned all of interstate travel. So it did restart on the 1st of June and then it stopped again. Um, just a few weeks ago. And having a look in terms of international arrival numbers, I mean, like I've said, you know, inbound travel across ASEAN has pretty much stopped. Um, and it's been pretty much stopped since, since March, April time. Um, but it's still interesting, I think, to see where the Philippines stacks up compared to some other Southeast Asian countries. Um, so this is January to August. I think they've now released the January, September numbers, but We'll go for August for now. And you can see Philippines is minus 72% year on year. So that's for the January to August international arrival numbers. Um, Singapore is the worst hit. So it's about minus 79%. Um, and that is because if you remember, Singapore was one of the first countries that was really suffering with COVID even back in February. And just then, it, I mean, it had very few, few numbers compared to now, right? I think it was perhaps a few hundred cases, but at that time, 
Uh, it seemed like a massive deal. I remember I was going on a business trip to Singapore in February and I was, you know, having doubts. Should I go? Shouldn't I go? And I went. Um, but when I went, half the travel agents um, were all closed. They were already empty at that point and they are still closed now. Um, other countries like Vietnam, they seem to not have been hit so much. And I think that that's really because they had a very, very strong January and a strong first half of February. And that kind of evened out. And Indonesia, they closed the borders a bit later than everybody else as well. So people were still coming in to Indonesia. And of course, travel, travel corridors, travel bubbles, reciprocal green lanes, whatever you want to call them. I mean, I think this is what everybody is looking for. This is what everybody is talking about at the moment, because this is the way that we see leisure travel and business travel um, reopening. So in terms of travel corridors, these travel bubbles negotiated, Philippines is pretty behind its ASEAN peers. Um, so last week there was some talk of um, an agreement being reached, I think a fast track agreement with China, but I haven't seen much more about that. So I think it's just in the initial stages. Um, whereas um, Malaysia, because they've opened up with Singapore, those two, have, they've got a really key kind of trading interlink because they've got that shared border. Thousands of people normally commute across the border every day. So it was really in their best interest to open this up. Um, and Singapore is really taking the lead. So right now um, they've got six travel bubbles negotiated with Malaysia, Indonesia, um, China, South Korea, Japan, Brunei. I realized I put Hong Kong for Indonesia, not for Singapore, so that Hong Kong coming should be for Singapore. And yesterday they announced that they should be starting a leisure travel bubble with Hong Kong. Um, because you can see all of the countries that they've got written there right now are for um, business travel or essential travel, not leisure travel. Whereas this would be the first kind of leisure travel bubble in the region between Hong Kong and Singapore. So Philippines is a bit lacking, but you know, it has also been struggling to contain COVID. So you can understand why they are not wanting to open up the country to additional risk, right? And have to negotiate that. So I thought we'd take a look at some of the kind of key developments that have been happening in the Philippines over the last, it's probably about a month or two now. Um, so first one, of course, right, Boracay Island. I don't think we can talk about the Philippines without talking about Boracay. Um, and this has really been in the news the last few weeks because it opened up to general domestic tourism from the 1st of October. Now, it opened up to um, tourists from the Western Visayas a lot earlier on the 16th of June, but they finally decided they were going to open up to all of the tourists. But how have the results been so far? Not great. Um, the governor last week has kind of revealed that the average number of arrivals each day is only about 50. Um, and versus before that, it was about 50,000 per day. Um, so this, I mean, it, you can't compare it, right? And if you're a hotel or you're a tourism company and you're on Boracay, okay, how can those 50 visits be divided among them? You know, they have to really make those kind of crucial decisions. Is it worth opening up now? Should I wait till longer? Um, one of the requirements for visiting the island is this need for an RT-PCR test, um, these rapid tests. And a lot of the local tourism industry have pointed out that this is really a potential blocker um, for tourists. You know, it's pricey. You've got to wait for the results to come in. And in some places, the cost of this test could be, you know, as much as the hotel rooms. So the hotel and resort owners have actually been heavily discounting rooms on the islands as well. I think something like up to 70%, up to 75%, just to try to counter that test fee. But we can see that it's still, still not really working yet. I mean, of course, it's going to take time. You know, it's not you open up on the 1st of October and suddenly you have thousands of people arriving, but 50 is still fairly little. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that the government has to think about was before they were opening, when they were open to Western Visayas, yes, it was quite a limited number of people that could travel in, right? But they still had tourists there. So between 16th of June to 20th September, they had a, almost 4,000 tourists who were visiting and they didn't need this RT-PCR test. They just needed, I think, a, a, an antigen test, a swab test. Um, but now, even if they want to come and visit Boracay, 
they also have to have this RT-PCR test, which is going to add that additional blocker even to, to kind of neighbouring uh, people residing nearby to come and visit the island. Um, so I think that the, the government that are looking into whether they can change that requirement, at least for the Western Visayas, back to what it was and see whether that can have an impact on the numbers. But, you know, like the DOT said, the reopening of Boracay to new source markets. It's really a gathering of momentum for domestic tourism all over the country. And this is really, I think, like a flag in the sand saying, yeah, domestic travel is reopened. So it is a positive move. I think they need to iron out some, some creases in that. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about was talking about this testing and how these resort owners are calling um, for the RT-PCR test to be replaced by swab tests. Now, the only thing that I would caution against this is when we look at Indonesia. So Bali reopened to domestic tourism on the, I think it was on the 31st of July. Um, so they opened initially to people on the island and then they opened up to the whole of Indonesia. Um, and they had this similar requirement. You just needed a rapid test, a negative test result to be able to enter. You didn't need this RT-PCR test. Um, but what we saw was that there started to be a surge of cases. Now, the government haven't, you know, officially linked the two together. They have, they, they're very reluctant actually to say that the increase in tourists to visit Bali has resulted in increasing cases. But people like the WHO have come out and they have said that they actually believe that using these kind of um, rapid tests, actually it gives a kind of false sense of security um, to visitors because they have such uh, low accuracy rates that you know people who perhaps are positive and they tested negative could be walking around feeling very confident that they're negative, not really taking the precautions that they, they should be to protect themselves and protect other people. And then that may have been what spread it. So, this is kind of one lesson I think that the Philippines can learn from Indonesia um, when it comes to testing. So moving on then to another development in the Philippines, which is this ridge and reef um, travel corridor, which I love the name, right? There's so many funny different names for travel corridors and bubbles at the moment, but I like ridge and reef, that's great. Um, so this is between uh, Baguio and Ilocos. Apologies if I'm pronouncing it wrong, obviously not from the Philippines. Um, but that opened up on um, the 1st of October. Again, a bit like Barakai, the results have been pretty limited. Um, so I think as of last week, um, it had had about 1,701 registrations on its online uh, visitor system only 179 of those I think were actually approved and for me when I look at this I mean I think it's the complex requirements which are dampening this so you've got to have pre-booking for accommodation you've got to pre-register your itinerary you've got to have your health declaration form your test there's a limit in terms of the numbers anyway how who can visit so you know only 200 tourists a day into Baguio 50 tourists a day into Ilocos there's a limitation on the age of tourists. There's a limitation if you are pregnant, you're not allowed to visit. Um, so by doing all of that, they are really, again, limiting that audience. Now, again, you know, I do believe that it is better to start small, right? I, I'm not suggesting and advocating that you open up for um, mass tourism and everybody comes in and, you know, no testing and no kind of controls, but this, it seems very hard work you know it seems like really hard work if you just want to go away for a long weekend to have to tick all of these boxes and what i think we can see from this i mean we talked about them registering on this baguio visitor system is that technology is starting to play a really really key role um, in terms of reviving um, tourism in the philippines and i mean you could say that this is true i think across asean as well all of these contact tracing apps and everything else. But it seems in the Philippines, I think in particular, the DOT are working really hard to, to make everything contactless, to, to really encourage the digitalization of tourism businesses. So I've read that the Tourism Promotions Board are actually even set to launch their own new app um, where you can book hotels and flights and tours. Um, you can have that kind of updated 
information about what travel requirements there are across the regions um, and that it should be compatible with other local government um, apps as well. So for example, the Visit Out One in Baguio, the Ultimate Boho experience as well. Um, I mean, overall, I think it's a good idea. The only thing that I am a bit um, puzzled by, I think, is perhaps the actual direct booking of hotels and flights and tours, because I do feel like perhaps it might circumvent uh, a potential revenue stream for travel agents. But, you know, I don't know the details on it. I don't know how commissions will work, how they, you know, planning it at all. But on the surface, it's... I understand why you would want updated information, but the booking role of it, I'm not so sure. Um, Cebu City is also working on a mobile app, again for tourism, due to launch next year. Um, and the DOT have given access to SafePass, which is helping all of the companies do contact tracing and health declarations and incident management solutions. So we are really seeing this kind of push, whether tourism businesses like it or not, uh, to digitalize, to innovate, to get online. And this is the other uh, development then in the Philippines that is happening right now. Again, um, beginning of October it was permitted, which is staycations. Um, so these staycations are permitted now in uh, GCQ areas, which is great, right? For Metro Manila, finally, these hotels can have some kind of form of revenue. They've gone seven months uh, without, you know, with very, very little access. Um, and finally, they have a chance. But again, there are really tight regulations. Um, so it has to be a four star or five star hotel. Um, you must be in the province where they're located. That kind of makes sense. You're in a staycation, so that's what it is anyhow. Um, there's a very, also a very strict number of guests you're allowed depending on the square meter size of the room, which is a little bit strange if you think about that I think you're only permitted to stay with people from your household anyway. Um, so presumably those people would also have you know, whether you have COVID, they will have COVID. So the, the idea of limiting the maximum number of guests doesn't make that much sense to me. I'm sure there's a reason for it. Um, cashless payment. Um, they're not allowed to operate their full facilities still. So yes, they can have the restaurants, but they can't have the bars, the gyms, the swimming pools. Um, but for me, the, I think the most crucial point for this that is going to be the sticking point is this need for a negative result from an antigen test on the same day as check-in. Um, and there is no other country in ASEAN right now that has such a regulation for staycations. Um, you know, I can't, I haven't come across anywhere if you are staying in the same province and you're holidaying in the same province that you will need to have a negative test to check in at the hotel. So, it's not an RT-PCR test, at least you don't have that cost, you don't have that time involved. The antigen tests are cheaper or quite, are quicker. But it's an additional layer that hotels are going to have to, to really contend with. Um, so it's a little bit too early, I think, to say yet what the results have been. Um, you know, as of the 11th of October, only eight luxury hotels uh, were approved. So it's slowly moving there. I do think that there will be a pickup in it. But again, I do think that it's somewhat limited by the fact that you have this requirement um, for these antigen tests. Um, and I wanted to share with you these actually. So these are a couple of kind of innovative, innovative um, staycations across ASEAN. Um, because, you know, if you're still in Manila, you are still limited in terms of places you can go. And the thing is, if you are encouraging um, staycations, there's a limit also to how many staycations you can go on. You know, if you're in Manila, you can't go on a staycation every weekend. You probably wouldn't want to. Maybe you might book one initially because of the thrill of being able to finally leave your own house. Um, but it's not going to be something that happens every week. And so you've got to come out with kind of innovative, creative ideas to encourage guests to want to stay with you. Um, so these are two that I have found from across ASEAN that I think are really great. Um, so the first one is um, Kuala Lumpur International Airport, um, so in Malaysia. And the Malaysia airports have teamed up with the airport hotel Sama Sama, and they are actually offering this kind of staycation at the airport, which sounds a bit strange, but you get to go and visit the airport fire station, you get to go and be a firefighter for the day, 
um, you know, the, in the initial um, marketing for it, they were calling them the pinup firemen as well. So you've got this idea of all of these really good looking firemen that you have these selfie opportunities with. Um, so for me, that's a really fun idea, right? It's, you get to go behind the scenes, you get to do something additional that you might not get to do otherwise. Um, and the other, um, which I think is a really great idea is in Singapore. And of course, Singapore is really, really limited when it comes to domestic tourism because it's a very small city state. It's an island, you, you really can't go anywhere. Um, so the hotels there have to be really innovative to think of different packages. Um, and this is one that the Millennium Hotels Group have come up with and they have partnered with the Wildlife Reserve Singapore. Um, and these guys have come up with wild experiences. Um, so essentially you can stay in the hotel and then you will get access to behind the scenes um, experiences. So this one was with the pandas, you can go and speak to the zookeeper, you can see how the pandas live, you can find out more about that. And they even had a really innovative um, quarantine package there. So even if you have to be quarantined in this hotel, you're arriving back, um, you still have the chance to experience this, but is it virtually. Um, so you've still got this really interactive experience, but you're in your room, but it's at least something to do, right? Rather than just being stuck in your hotel room for two weeks. I think that we can't look at the domestic tourism industry without looking at what the impact has been on aviation in the Philippines. I mean, and I'm sure you guys have all seen uh, headlines that are coming out there. So if we look just at the main two, Philippine Airlines and Cebu Pacific, um, they're both doing really, really badly. Um, so Philippine Airlines right now is flying at just 15% capacity. Um, they are likely to make 35% of its staff redundant. And I know that the government is trying to ask the airline not to do that, saying that, you know, more travel is going to happen soon. But I think, you know, Philippine Airlines has lasted a really long time without having to make such a deep cut in staff. And realistically speaking, the recovery for the aviation industry is going to be at least a few years. I think they're going to have to make these cuts. Um, and they've had a huge amount of refund requests as well. So they had 329 million USD uh, refund requests, which they've now refunded 80%. And the losses are kind of staggering. So this is Q2, 11.55 billion pesos. I mean, that's, that's big money. If we compare that over to Cebu Pacific, um, Cebu Pacific have made 800 staff redundant so far. Um, so a lot fewer than Philippine Airlines. Um, they are right now trying to raise more funds. So they're trying to raise an additional 500 million USD. Um, in terms of refunds, they've had 2.4 billion uh, pesos um, refund requests. And their losses were less than Philippine Airlines. So their losses are about almost 8 billion um, pesos. They're really significant. And if we look at kind of air traffic recovery, um, I wanted to show you how, again, Manila compares to other countries. So this is kind of the daily number of flights and at the top it is pretty much 100% and you can see then how, how it works out. But you can see there that Manila, yes, it did start to recover and come back up a little bit from June, but it has not really gone much further. Whereas you look at countries like Jakarta, it's a little bit higher. You look at countries like Vietnam, um, Ho Chi Minh, and here you can really see they started to almost come back to the same levels. Um, and in terms of domestic travel, domestic flights, they were almost at 100%. And in some cases, they actually expanded their air route. So they were even going beyond what last year's domestic uh, air travel was. But then they had their second wave. So you can see that dip down again and then rising back again. So it is back on the rise. And you can see already where the levels are at now, it's much higher than where the Philippines is. Now, what's the government's take on whether to help airlines or not? Um, well, last week they came out and they said, whatever assistance we have or we're going to provide is only part of the process. Private banks have to do the majority of that and the government does not want to end up owning the airlines. Um, so it's, it's very limited support really in terms of what the government will also provide. You know, they are not saying we're going to save Philippine Airlines, we're going to save Cebu Pacific. 
is very much kind of throwing it out to private sector and to see what comes out of that. And if we compare that to um, other countries in ASEAN, and again, all ASEAN airlines are struggling. I mean, we've had Thai Airways that have even had to go into a bankruptcy rehabilitation. They, you know, and they haven't been flying. Um, countries like Malaysia, Malaysia Airlines, the national flagship carrier there, really struggling. Ministry is actually taking a very similar line to the Philippines, um, saying they are not going to inject any more cash into the airline. Singapore is completely the opposite. Um, and I think that is down to Singapore being such a crucial air transit hub, down to them really situating themselves as, you know, a, the connection between Asia and Australasia and, and Europe. And they recognize, you know, they said, what well, is not just hundreds of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs, even that are at stake for the aviation industry, but it's their status, it's their relevance to their world, their economic survival, you know, their ability to determine their own future. So for them, they see aviation as absolutely crucial and they will throw whatever they can at, I think, at saving Singapore Airlines. But it's a different situation to the Philippines. So having a quick look then at 2021, um, yeah, I mean, we have still this predicted contraction of GDP in the Philippines in 2020. So it's predicted to contract by 7.3%. But the rebound is still being predicted at 6.5% by Asian Development Bank. Um, so there's still this upside. I think everybody just feels like it just needs to get the COVID situation under control and then the economy can start to recover. Um, in terms of unemployment, um, Maybank did a study earlier, I think in the year, and they thought the Philippines might have the highest unemployment rate in Southeast Asia. They have 18.5% they predicted by the year end. Um, generally, I think this, the, the feeling amongst uh, local people is pretty gloomy. Um, so a social weathers um, survey came out in September and 57% still believe the worst is yet to come which is a not great, I don't think, from a consumer sentiment point of view. And a McKinsey survey, and this was back in July, it said 74% of people had cut back on spending. That was in July, so that's already a few months ago. I think probably by now that number will have gone up. So it's been pretty gloomy, right? But I want to end with a couple of more kind of uplifting, positive news for you all. Um, so one is that that desire for travel is still there amongst Filipinos, right? That has not gone. Um, so the Hotel and Marketing um, Sales Association had their September online hotel fair. Uh, I think it ran for a couple of weeks, um, a few weeks ago, and they managed to generate income, right? So they generated uh, 14.1 million pesos. And remember, this actually started before they announced that staycations would be permitted in the Philippines. So they announced it was the, the sale was still ongoing. So they managed to sell 1000 vouchers. And you can see a, a lot of that was in Manila, you've got Boracay, you've got Visayas, Palawan, there's really a demand there to buy. And on the other side of it, you know, in terms of inbound into the Philippines, well, the Philippines is still really you know, winning global recognition at the moment. So um, last week, um, the Condé Nast Traveller announced their top 10 Asian islands. Um, and uh, Cebu and Visayan Islands actually came out number one um, for Asia, which is great news because it really puts Philippines on the map for when inbound travel does happen again. Um, and again, there's that interest in Philippines as a destination. They had Phytex, which was um, kind of a, a B2B trades trade fair that happened not too long ago and just from the initial few days they generated 15.6 million pesos and I think that only accounted for about 20 percent of the suppliers at that time they hadn't counted everybody yet so there is desire not only for Filipinos to travel but also for people to come inbound into the Philippines too it's just that of course the main barrier to that is when will borders open when will the kind of COVID situation become under control. So that is a, a really kind of brief overview of what is happening in the Philippines. And there are, you know, lots and lots more stories that I didn't have time to share. Um, but I would just say, you know, if you are wanting to keep updated, um, run this weekly report, 
you can sign up at peranderson.com slash coronavirus. Um, yeah, and I cover updates across Southeast Asia. So any Thanks, Hannah, for that. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is from Orson Wong. Uh, and the question is, have they considered where the potential tourists will be coming from? For example, I'm from Bacolod, uh, which is in Western Visayas, but I wish I could visit Boracay soon. The problem is when we come back to Bacolod, we need to quarantine like normal LSIs. How is it for other LGUs and for NCR? Which is oh. Yeah. Metro, Metro, Manila, right? Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, actually, if I am very honest, I am not even, there's, it, there's so much going on with the, I haven't even had time to kind of catch up with what the regulations are when you are returning. Um, but for sure, this is going to be an issue. Um, you know, if you, you know, you, you would imagine that if you have this travel corridor, between the two, then in theory, there shouldn't have to be any quarantine regulations when you come back. Else, it's just the same. It's just a huge travel, isn't it? People are not going to want to go on a you know weekend staycation and then have to quarantine for two weeks when they get home. No way. Yeah, I guess uh, further to that, you know, if you take a look at the the land-based countries, say uh, Vietnam, that have provinces, a, a, a section of, of Indonesia, a section. Of, of Malaysia, right? Within the land-based area, sort of like Luzon, right? Are any other countries having the same challenge for each municipality, each township has a has a different reading on on the the, the protocols per se? Um, I think one country where that did happen was Myanmar. Um, so mm -hmm. Myanmar certainly, I mean, and it, you know, they don't have as much domestic tourism, they don't have as much tourism in general as a country like the Philippines. But again, yes, they did have this problem with different governments coming out with different regulations, even if you're a foreigner res residing in Myanmar, maybe you weren't accepted, different interpretations. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I look at the Philippines as an outsider, I think that is one of the key obstacles as well as this kind of multiple LGUs and how does that then interact with things like the DOT because even when you look at when domestic flights reopened in the Philippines um, you had people mm -hmm. like the airlines already right you had like Philippine Airlines Air Asia they were already to and then the LGU suddenly turned around and said sorry you can't fly and it got really messy right and that's when you got all of these stranded workers at the airports so certainly I think that there needs to be a better level between everybody because it's just going to get very messy very quickly especially now that Philippines is starting to reopen. Yeah. I guess a related question from Lilibeth uh, by losses mm -hmm. right now who said she said uh, can you share best practices being implemented by other countries in order to handle the crisis balancing the threat of the COVID and the threat of the economy going down the drain due to too many restrictions mm -hmm. I guess my, my, my addition to that would be mm -hmm. do you find that in other ASEAN countries is, is it the federal government that has more of a say that they give direction to the LGUs or is it or the LGUs really have a sort of an equal say in the matter? How would you, how would you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say, I think in the majority of other ASEAN countries, it is the federal government who kind of have the final say. Um, I think the provincial state governments do have some kind of say they can modify some of the uh, the regulations but overall it is the federal government and in that way it kind of makes things simpler it simplifies it because it reduces that friction you know between the two um, the two LGUs so for example in Malaysia um, when we first started to ease the lockdowns I think back in July we did have this issue where, back in June I think where the federal government said okay these are the new restrictions and they had changed it you know in terms of people gathering together or mosques being open or so on and the local state government said no 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 we don't want to open yet and there was quite a I think a controversy between that and I think the federal government pretty much turned around in the end and told the state governments no you, you've, you've pretty much got to follow the line you can't just make up your own rules about this. Um, yeah, the I, I mentioned to, to Hannah the story that my my nephew's uh, a uh, relation of my nephew came as a seaman and came back to Manila by plane. And when he arrived in Manila, he was quarantined for 14 days. Then he flew to Iloilo, 
and he was quarantined for 14 days. And then finally he took a bus from Iloilo to Santa Barbara, which is maybe about 30, 35 minutes. And he was quarantined for another 14 days, right? Because they each have their, their, their protocols in place, which is sort of similar to, to the earlier questions we fielded, which I think is going to be, a, it, it goes so, sort of hand in hand with the fact that luxury hotels have opened up in Metro Manila, but they require the antigen test day of. So it, to a degree, I guess it's, you, could you say it's early days and that as they learn along the way that these, these protocols will become a bit more refined and, and practical, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think what I would love more is for, for ASEAN countries to really Sorry, Hannah, you sort of froze up. Okay. To learn from that, to avoid, you know, there's other governments having to make that same mistake again. Yeah. How do you see the, the I guess, you, could you say that for domestic tourism in the Philippines, it's going to be land-based first? <laughs> um, because, they, you know, one of our advantages is that we have so many beautiful beaches because you have 7,000 plus islands, but at the same time, you have to take an airplane to get to those islands. And, and the only major land base we have would really be um, Mindanao in the south and certainly Luzon and, and where we are now, right? Um, so we don't really have where Thailand is completely land-based and other significant land-based. So um, would you say then that in terms of our progression, we are really still going to be dependent on air travel for or um, I guess the major amount of economic spending, domestic economic spending, because they don't like to spend it within NCR. They want to go down to Boracay and Bohol and, and those places. It's yeah, it, 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 it is, it is. It will be interesting how, how that plays out, I think. Um, as you know, again, of Bangkok. Necessarily flying to Koh Samui or flying to Phuket or flying to Chiang Mai. So anywhere still where you have to get on a plane, those, those provinces are still really struggling. They're still really struggling to get up to the numbers. Whereas places like Pattaya on the weekends, the occupancy is, is okay. It's you know not as good as it was before, but it, it's climbing up there. Um, let's see, there's a, there a comment which I completely support. This is from Julian and she mm. said, uh, thank you very much, Hannah, for all these realistic insights on the zone in the Philippines. I've been participating in many online conferences in the Philippines regarding their economy and none has been as realistic as you have been. Kudos thank to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I mean, I, I hope it has not been too pessimistic. I mean, I did try to end with a little bit of of optimism, but I, you know, I think we're all in, we're all in the tourism industry, and I think we all have to, to kind of see the reality of what it is, um, but to still remain hopeful, right? And I think deep down, people still do want to travel; they still will travel. We've just got to be patient. Um, I guess one thing we haven't quite touched on, although it's related, mm. how how yeah. do you find restaurant, the restaurant business, in, in through a CN? Is it uh, in the Philippines, the restaurant business has really been hammered. Um, and how is it in Thailand or, or Malaysia or other places? How are they it's, dealing it's, with the, the dine in versus the dine out, I guess? Um, definitely, it's still a, a big, big issue, I think. Um, and you're seeing a lot of the smaller independent chains going, um, especially in um, you know, countries where the situation is a little bit fluid. Um, so, in Malaysia even right now. So we're going through a second lockdown. I don't know if many people watching it know I'm based in KL. Um, and even before, so the cases started to spike up last week, even then I saw, you know, friends owning restaurants complaining about low sales, you know, like they've been open the whole day and they'd only made about 40 ringgits, like 10 USD or something the whole, mm. the whole day. So it, I think it's something a bit like travel, isn't it? That is really, really linked to, to um, consumer confidence. And if you feel confident to go out, then you'll eat. 
and it's great. And if you feel scared, you are going to stay home. Maybe you'll order in. So of course that there is that, and I think that has increased, but it, you know, you're not getting things like the beverages and people probably not going to order beverages when they order the take-in. So you're missing a huge chunk of profit that way too. Well, good. Um, see if anybody else would like to ask Hannah some questions. Come on, guys, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. <laughs> um, let's see, what is what do you do? You, oh, it's a, um, do you see really a contraction of the airlines in general? Other than you mentioned, Singapore Airlines will be sustained. Um, I guess how if there's no rebound v-shape or otherwise say in six months do you start seeing a lot more cutbacks for asian airlines in, yeah. in more severe fashion than it is now yeah definitely i think so i think a lot of airlines right now are hanging on and they're kind of hanging on because everybody has felt like january everything will change right and I, you know and I've, I've been guilty of this as well just thinking january is new year it's a new a new dawn um, and I, I think we're getting very close to uh, the end of the year now. And I think airlines are realistic. And, well, you know, international outbound travel is such a huge part of our mm -hmm. revenue and normally over 50% for most airlines, some airlines more. Without that, we just can't sustain it. So we are going to have to make staff cuts and we are going to have to relook at you know, the, the aircraft that we lease. And we are going to have to think about reducing that all down because it just doesn't make economic sense to conserve this airline when the demand might not even be back for a few years yet. So I think we're definitely going to see more airlines shrink down, routes being cut, frequencies being cut. And of course, that's going to impact later on, on, you know, domestic travel and international travel in general, because we won't have those frequencies. It might not be so convenient to just jump on a plane and, you know, go to Bangkok for the weekend because yes. maybe the flight times don't work out anymore or like prices are really expensive. Yes. Which was actually the last question was like, when do you think tourism will, will be back to normal? Back to normal. <laughs> will there ever? <laughs> yeah, I know that is the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I, I do strongly believe that by the end of the year, there will be some kind of ASEAN leisure travel bubble in some form. You know, I did used to believe that would be Singapore and Malaysia. Now Malaysia has had this lockdown again. I, I don't think that's likely. But there are certainly lots of countries that have the potential to do that. Vietnam and Laos, for example, mm -hmm. they've both got Cambodia. I think we will start to see something. I think by Q1, we'll start to see some more because ultimately, I think governments will realize that they can't keep borders closed indefinitely. Yes. I know a lot of this, you know, it depends on a vaccine will a vaccine come out? And I think everybody is pinning their hopes on this vaccine. But again, you know, everybody has to be realistic that everybody is not going to be inoculated all at the same time. Everybody is 100%, you know, ready to go. It's, that's not going to happen, you know, right? That's going to be in phases. So I don't know. I, I hope at least by middle of next year, we're going to see some more significant leisure travel, you know, both outbound and inbound. But normal, I don't think for a couple of years yet, I think. And that's perhaps being optimistic. But I'll stay optimistic. You, perhaps a better, a better uh, twist on that would be, instead of normal would be, when will there be more positive momentum? Right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah. um, you know, it, it was that old saying, rising water lifts all boats, right? So mm. I guess the key is that once there, there's a more of a surge uh, yeah. And anything compared to now is a surge, <laughs> a surge of positivity and travel and, and, and whatever, right? So. Yeah, and I see a lot of that actually being driven by Singapore. Uh, you know, I shared earlier that they have a lot of these travel corridors negotiating. I think they're going to be one of the first to have a leisure travel bubble negotiated as well. What my hope is, is that other ASEAN countries who are being a bit more cautious, a bit more conservative, see Singapore making a success out of it. And then they decide that they're going to follow suit. Um, that's what I hope. But it's going to take some time now. Maybe Q1. I think Q1 next year, we'll see some more, you know, positive momentum, like you say. Oh, another question quote, mm. uh, from uh, Amy. Um, mm. And he asked, I've been seeing a lot of super sales in international travel tickets now. Do you think that's an effective strategy to at least keep up with business? 
I mean, yeah, I think at this point you've got to do what you can, right? And if you can find customers who are confident enough to uh, book that ticket, then okay. It's almost like they are kind of owning a little share in the airline in a way, isn't it? You're, you're keeping it going by that, by that momentum. So. What, what is your take on pricing for hotels during this period that we're in now? Say hotels, uh, airlines, uh, I guess food would be a secondary one, but certainly how do, you, how, do you, how do you see hotels should be pricing themselves? It's a tricky question, isn't it? Because you know, we have seen a lot of uh, price dropping you know, in Malaysia, you can get five-star hotels for really, really, uh, you know, maybe three-star, two-star rates um, nowadays. But it's tricky because short-term, yes, you're keeping the lights on, you're, you're staying open, but perhaps medium-term, you are now educating your customers to expect those lower rates. And when it is time to increase those rates, you might run into, into trouble. And it's probably a smarter technique doing, you know, the kind of value ads or the room credits or... So essentially, yeah. you're giving them the cheaper rate, but yeah, they have to stay, have to stay longer, or they have to go stay in the spa, or go buy, go purchase in your restaurant. At least you're making it go a little bit further, I think. Okay, interesting. My my nephew booked um, he took his he booked a two week stay at a resort because he got a good deal, and he's just going to work from the resort, and his family will enjoy the beach because basically there's nobody there. I said, how did you do that? He said, because nobody else asked. So he made a deal. He said, would you take 14 days straight where we could prepay everything, right? And then, so he said, yeah, sure. The difference was, yeah. as you said, the difference is like keeping the lights on and keep, keeping people employed, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of it is just about <laughs> okay. hold on to the talent. So uh, when the bounce back comes, you've got the place yes then you're ready which is another going to be another concern say in early early next year middle next year third quarter next year is when there's a bounce of any kind how many people are ready to then take the take the uh, increase massive increase in business relatively okay well on that note thank you so much hannah for spending time your insights wonderful right and everybody has your contact information and and we'll be seeing hannah again because we're definitely not going to let her go once but thank you very much <laughs> hannah for this uh it's been yeah. great insightful right take care thank God. you thank you guys you, the audience too thank you very much for your time we hope you learn i'm sure you learned something today and ask questions right so take care god bless to everybody keep safe thank you bye, bye. Thank you once again, Mr. Merrill Yu and Ms. Hannah Pearson for sharing your valuable time and knowledge with us. You can follow our presenters on LinkedIn for more insights about the hospitality industry. Mr. Yu will be back tomorrow at 1 p.m. to moderate the remake for New Times with Shelle Gonzalez. We will also have a back-to-back -back talk by Rick Yelton of World of Concrete and Calvin Trillias of Pacific Paint Boysen Philippines tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. as well as the lifestyle show to be presented by the Philippine Institute of Interior Designers. Don't forget to check out hotel and restaurant suppliers in the exhibition hall. Tomorrow's our last live day. To stay updated, follow our Facebook and Instagram page at Hotel Supplier Show. See you again tomorrow 